Let's jump in. Hi, everybody. Right, let's do it. Hi, everybody. Okay. Um, all right. Say so five and a half to six and a half months of age is where like the bulk of infants are going to sit along that that chart. But sometimes we see it closer to seven, and that's okay too. You've got your whole yeah. Baby that's what I would like to eat. That was what I was going to ask. So people say, okay, what if my baby isn't like at six months? It's six months and one day. I think somebody just put this yeah. in a question. It's six months and one day, and like my baby isn't doing those things, and like. Do, like what is it broken well first of uh, all like for those of you who have six month olds who are like wow all the other six month olds are there my baby is not remember that even like one week in time at this age is like light years there's in terms of development right like next week they might be rolling and they were never rolling before um so the the, it, the speed of it can happen really quickly so don't get you know down on yourself if you feel like your child is behind or not quite there with some of these milestones but the other thing too is like look can i just say that in 1880 babies were not starting solids until 11 months of age people so like okay. it's okay now is that the permission from solid starts to just breastfeed forever do whatever and do any solid food no we want to be reasonable about it the reason why a lot of pediatricians love the four month mark and are still sort of hung up on rice cereal or infant cereal is because those products are fortified with iron and yeah. you know doctors are they really zoom in on iron and yes iron is critical and yes you want to focus on high iron foods but you can you can meet those goals even if you're starting at seven months because you know the baby is born with a reserves of iron in their body um, from the mother and so the reason that six months becomes important is because those reserves start to deplete um, with some time but it's not like six months, the baby has no iron reserves Over. and it's completely gone and it's an emergency and you have to start doing chicken liver every day. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So a lot of people have this question, which I actually also wonder about. I'm curious what you said. So, so one of the big things we talk about early on is allergen exposure and all of the data behind the kind of importance of early allergen exposure. And in those experiments, they actually start at four months, right? So they're sort of starting like four, four or five months with yeah. the early allergens. Yeah. How do I do that? And also, you don't have to. Here's, here's, there's, a, there's a sort of fine point when it comes to um, the, the LEAP and the LEAP on studies and the other ones about the early introduction of peanut and things like that. Here's the fine point. What, particularly with peanut and egg, those studies were done on infants at risk of allergy and not just even at risk, but at high risk of allergy. And that's actually where the biggest benefit is. I know you have a daycare, I'm sorry. a daycare no, cold I, or a school oh cold, we're all it's getting like, them. It's out. something, it's a week one. Like, <laughs> you I need water, really, go ahead, I no, can, no, I can I carry it. I was just, I like, on some radio program earlier, I just like, like lost it. And the, the guy was like, okay, well, we're gonna, we're gonna move Look, away from you. I oh, totally left people on a live hanging for like three solid minutes when I put <laughs> stop coughing one time. So if you have to get water, I will. Fair enough, all right. Keep okay, telling me, so, what am I doing about the allergens? <laughs> so listen, so the benefit of the early introduction of allergens in those studies was focused on high infants at risk of high allergens. What does that mean? It means the baby likely has severe eczema, maybe asthma or other things that put them in the risk category for food allergens. Remember that only like 8% of you are going to have children with food allergies. 92% of you are likely going to be like free and clear from this stress. So our fear of allergens, I think, is out of proportion yeah. with the statistical likelihood of it happening. But we do know that early introduction does have an impact and the impact was significant. So in the case of the peanut studies, which is sort of a landmark study, right, completely yeah changed the game because if you were a mom or a dad back in you know 1995 your pediatrician would have said hold off on all allergens until age three like mm -hmm. don't do anything they had it backwards it's sort of that the, was the opposite answer. that was the so opposite so what we know okay. is that if your infant is at risk your allergist or pediatrician is likely going to suggest early, early introduction. For me, that's around three or four months of age, and they may be doing it via a powder or you know, some other sort of measured way of going about it. Yeah. The majority of babies who are not at risk of food allergies um, can just start when they start solids. You don't have to go any earlier than that. You don't need to buy any special products to do it mm. either. Um, even just a little smear of peanut butter thin with water on the lips can be a great way to start around. Scrambled eggs. My kids yeah. love scrambled yeah. eggs as like yeah. 
and early. Yeah. yeah. And again, it's like, yeah, 20 years ago, the advice was completely the opposite. So there's a reason why there's a lot of anxiety and swirling confusion and overwhelm when it comes to starting solids and all things babies. <laughs> yeah. And all, and all things babies, right. We can have this, we have this call about all topics. Um, yeah. So that's, that's extremely helpful. I think that's a great, that's a, yeah, that's a really helpful, uh, helpful frame. So somebody had a question, which I think is, is really sort of related to the second topic I want to talk about, which is like the anxiety. Yeah. about starting and I think one piece of that anxiety is like I just don't know what to do and this is where I have found like candidly I find yourself the most helpful this sort of first hundred days like just like here is a guide to how to do this is just like so great but then there's other anxiety which is like I'm afraid of my kid choking or I'm afraid yeah. like I just like that fear so I wonder if you can talk a little particularly about the choking but just in general about this kind of fear of I don't know, fear of food, basically. Somebody yeah. just said, I'm so nervous with it. You know, with the negative I, look, in a lot of ways, that fear is why I'm here and what got me here. And so, you know, our story in a quick snapshot is that I was like that mom. I put the tiniest drop of puree on a spoon, didn't let my baby grab it, so gently put it on the tongue and was like, ah, and you know, what's going to happen here? And I did that for 18 months, 18 okay. months. Cool. So, you know, the effects of very controlled um, helicopter hovering parenting styles um, is proven in evidence and research that there is a greater risk of severe picky eating when the parent, mm -hmm. and interestingly, particularly um, maternal pressure, yeah. um, it, you know, you're just more likely to end up on that path. And it's common sense too, when you really think about it. But, the, you know, your, your child's going to feel your anxiety at the table is sort yeah. of the, the bottom line of, of that research. And the more you try to control it, the less they're going to want to come to that experience. That's why I'm here. My, my whole purpose is to try to help parents prevent picky eating to the extent it's possible. Mm -hmm. There's always going to be a small percentage of kids who will end up picky no matter what, um, whether it's their disposition, they don't like change, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but the vast majority, we've got some wiggle room there to kind of coach yeah. and shape that course. Back to anxiety. Um, so I shared that because I, I, I feel it, I felt it, I know what that's like. And I think every first time parent feels that. Your primary job is to keep this child alive. Like, you know, let's remember that. And then here you've got everything going, your schedule set, and all of a sudden it's like this new, big, scary thing comes in. Yeah. And similar to allergies, if we look at the data, you look at the numbers, you look at the emergency room statistics, the likelihood of your baby choking is so much lower than that of drowning, so much lower than that than car accidents, so much lower than that than firearm accidents. I hate that I have to say that nowadays, but it's true. true. Um, and, and lower than SIDS as well. So I think one of the reasons we feel so afraid is in part because of the way the CDC groups the data into accidents, there's sort of a category of data that says, okay, the number one risk of death in children under age four are accidents and choking is one of those accidents. It's one of many, including drowning, including car accidents, including all these other things. When you do the chart, choking actually doesn't show up on the chart because it's so low. So I think the way the data was grouped has led media to then use this talking point that choking is one of the like number one causes or you know one of the top causes of death under age four when it's actually not true um, it's actually yeah. really rare that said watching your baby take a piece of food not quite sure know what to do with it the piece of food was probably too big how are they going to chew it they don't have teeth all these things are swirling around that anxiety is really natural here's what i can say that helped me the most just as a mom we're a team of doctors and allergists and nutritionists and swallowing specialists and all the things but it's like okay but talk to me as a mom tell me the mom <laughs> because the this mom. is my baby and this is my heart so the thing that helped me the most was learning about the gag reflex. I always thought in my head the gag reflex must have indicated that I cut the food the wrong way or that I did something incorrectly or that it's going to lead to baby choking, that baby's not when we say ready gag reflex, for this food in their mouth. When in fact, it's the like, opposite. Like that. Yeah. Like, 
Yeah, and it's hard to watch and it's retching and they might vomit and you feel like the worst parent on the planet. But here's the thing, the gag has your back. And this is what I love about our feeding team, our infant swallowing specialists at Solid Starts is that they have taught me that the gag reflex is so powerful and so sensitive in the six to nine month age range and a little bit more to six to 12, but it starts to fade between nine and 12 months. It doesn't go away entirely. It's just not triggered as easily as some of the, as it was earlier. So in a lot of ways, it's the perfect time. That six to nine month age range mm-hmm. is the perfect time to start solids and the perfect time to explore and to let baby make mistakes because the gag has your back. Fun fact, when baby is gagging, so you have two tubes, you have an air tube, how you breathe, and you have a food tube, okay? You could swallow a too big piece of steak and not choke, even if it wasn't chewed. It'll go down your food tube, and you may have felt that at a restaurant when you're talking, you swallow something before it was chewed all the way, and it kind of like kind of hurts and it feels stuck and you're like, wait, am I choking? But no, I'm breathing. I'm not choking. And it's a little confusing. That's just food going down your food tube, your esophagus, which is elastic and it's trying to push it down. But it was just a little bit too big. It's not necessarily inherently dangerous to swallow a too big piece of food. But I think people think that it is. What choking is, is when the food goes down the wrong tube and gets stuck in the airway. That's, and that's basically a miscoordination of the swallow. So it's not that the food is too big or that baby's not ready. It's that the food that literally a brain, like, <coughs> a brainstem connection went wrong and the airway wasn't covered when the food was going down. The brain is beautiful. It covers baby's airway. A little flap of tissue called the epiglottis covers the airway. I'm really impressed I know that. Covers the airway to let food slide into the esophagus. So for baby to choke, there has to be a failure of that uh, covering Mm -hmm. of the airway, which is why we are so... um, Uh, emphatic about not feeding babies and children when they are uh, playing, crawling, running around in a car seat near sudden noises because things that could cause the failure of that airway not being covered, which could then lead to choking, which by the way, you can still cough food out, right? You may have sputtered water before. Things can get in your airway and go back out. We're worried about things that get stuck. Yeah, we're worried about things that get stuck in the airway, right? Um, that you don't have the force of a cough, a cough can't get it out. But the things that increase the risk and wait for it, caregiver placing food in a child's mouth. There is data to support that. So, you know, we have this whole um, body of history behind us telling us that this is the way we should do it because that's the way my mom did it or that's the way my grandma did it. But if you skip a few generations and you go back a little further, they did your it great, great grandmother probably would have said, baby led weaning, that's what I was doing before. Right. And did you like you gave <laughs> before that the Vitamix existed like, or the yeah. puree machines or the perfect, you know, processors for, for baby food. So sorry, I went on a little tangent. No, 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 there. No, that, was, that was great. Yeah. And I mean I you know, I think this point about sort of the, the baby led weaning versus puree kind of discussion. I mean, obviously that has has you know moved a lot over time. And when you, yeah. you look at the data, you know, I think that some I mean, we, I'm not sure how like the some of the data where people wonder, well, do I have to, like, do I have to do this? You know, people say like, is my baby going to be broken if I, if I use purees? And, and you know, there's like absolutely many different ways to, in, to introduce yeah. this. Yeah. On the flip side, there's this sort of narrative, like, you know, baby led weaning is dangerous, baby led weaning, and it was also not. So I think a lot of this in this space is really about, uh, is really, I think about people figuring out what sort of what works for them within the range of things that are kind of like reasonable and, and yeah. safe. And I will tell you, I did different things with my two kids. Yeah. So with my daughter, we had the bottles of the purees. We had this whole closet, this like, we had these like pallets of, you know, things in the closet <laughs> and we had it different every three days. We did the whole, the whole business. And my son was one of these kids who like was totally at, like from, you know, like four months in one day, like sitting up, at the table, like, Ready lunging to go. For, like lunging for the food. And the, his first food was like 
kanji at the Chinese restaurant, which I wouldn't <laughs> recommend. And I don't think that is in the solid. So I don't think that appears in like day one of solid start. So it'll be in the happens. database soon though. <laughs> but, but you know, it really was like, like for him, like he was sort of very, like, it, it was just like, it was very clear that I had sort of two pretty different kids. And also my sort of attitude towards this was, yeah. Yeah. Um, Look, was you know, different. the, the whole baby led meaning versus purees thing is, is an unfortunate dichotomy at best. I agree. Um, and I, I really, I just want to say that there are downsides to not being responsive to your unique child. And there are also downsides to doing any one method, if you will, for too long. The, the goal is to get baby to the family meal. How you do that yep. and whether that's a straight a linear path or really curvy and windy is totally fine. Kids are really resilient. Babies are really resilient, which is why you could see a baby led weaning baby be fed purees at daycare and do totally fine chomping on a yep. steak at home and it doesn't kind of interrupt that cognitive process. Um, but what we do know is it's about the duration of purees. If you are feeding your baby texture, exclusively <coughs> textureless food, yep and you are putting that on a spoon and you are delivering that to their mouth and putting it on their tongue, they are not going to as rapidly develop the oral motor skills needed for becoming a safe eater eating chewable food. The interesting thing that I think is gonna shift the dialogue in the medical community over the next 10 years and very much where we are um, kind of position is that what we do know is that there is some pretty solid research saying that the most optimal time for a baby to learn how to chew really thoroughly is actually six to nine months of age, conveniently when the gag reflex is mm -hmm. also at its most protective and most sensitive. So those two things go really well together. Like nature did something right there. Mm. Now, does that mean that if you do purees until 10 months and then you do chewable food, uh, your baby's ruined and gonna become a picky? No. At least, no, no, it doesn't. Obviously. It just means that it's easier. It's easier for baby to get it in that window, which then can make the dynamic at the table with the parent easier. Yeah. And I, I mean, think it's it's times it's like we, we as parents bring stuff to the table. Like think back yeah. to what your parents brought to the table, what kind of baggage your parents, maybe your mom had an eating disorder or maybe, you know, whatever it is, maybe dad ate so fast you couldn't even get in there to get a slice of pizza because it was gone before you reached for it. We, we, we all bring, whether we like it or not, we bring that baggage to the table. We want to focus on the data and say, look, the traditional way of starting solids and feeding babies with rice cereal at four months and completely bland textureless food is not optimal if you want to have an eater who is open to vegetables and open to new foods and who wants to explore and be curious about food. That actually takes a little bit of work and a little bit of guidance mm -hmm. and kind of coaching to get there. Uh, because babies will just go right back to bottle and breast milk if, if they can. It's the easier yeah. thing to do. Chewing takes a lot of work. <laughs> No, it's totally, it's totally right. I wish I didn't have to, you know, work so much on that. Um, no, but I mean, it, it is, you know, there is a fair amount of research in this space on exposure, on repeat exposure, which yes. all kind of it, is, it relates to this, that like, maybe they don't like it the first time. And I think often for parents introducing foods, it's like, well, I gave them the avocado and they didn't like it. So I guess they don't eat avocado. It's like, no, that's not really the, like, that's not, that's not true. Yeah, it's you rarely know, about the food. food. It's rarely about the food. Um, you know, yeah, there are definitely foods, you know, that some, some kids will just be like, yeah, I just, ultimately, they just don't like some food, yeah. but it's, it's certainly not, you could not learn that from one repeat. Yeah, the, the key with that, and I, I say this because I see a lot of accounts saying, don't worry, just offer it like 20,000 more times and eventually your baby will like it, or don't worry that they rejected it because it takes 20 to 30 exposures for a child to like something. That, like that is not actually super applicable to six to 11 month old babies. Six huh. to 11 month old babies are like, bring it, I'm ready. I'm gonna put dad's shoe in my mouth. I'm gonna put this in my mouth. They are wired to explore the world orally, which is why we love the early introduction of finger food and just the flavors, whether it's a flavorful puree and even spice in that puree, or you know, whole hog uh, rib bone or whatever it is. We love that early flavor 
exposure because you're capitalizing on a moment in time developmentally when the baby is wired to explore. Mm -hmm. And at 12 months of age and closer to 18 months of age, like in that range, you've got this neophobia, the fear of new things developing yeah. in toddlerhood, whether it's the fear of a new person or the fear of a new fear food. food. That seems so if you wait until 12 or 13 months of age or later to introduce a new food, you just have more of an uphill battle in getting them to like it. But if they've become familiar with broccoli and they're like, oh yeah, broccoli's fun, broccoli's good, by 12 months of age, you've got a shot at that staying in the diet. Yeah, so that's a great, that's a great point. Okay, so our, my last thing that I wanna talk about is salt. Okay. Uh, and, the, and so, so uh, people are very afraid of salt in their, in their baby's food. And uh, how, how should I phrase this question? So a I guess the way I often get this is I am making a meal for my family and I want to give some of it to my nine month old. And I, should I make a separate container of it that is unsalted? No, you don't have to. Okay. I, I will quite agree. <laughs> the easy answer with this. Look, um, the reason in my opinion, that so many people are afraid of salt and babies is because if you Google salt and babies, some of the news hits okay. that comes yeah. up are intentional salt poisoning incidents where the caregiver was trying to hurt the child. Um, I just actually spoke to Dr. Ruiz on our team um, about, about salt, because I, I know that's a topic that you're interested in. <laughs> yes, you know, she okay, said, <laughs> she was in surgery and she actually took my test. She said, look, for salt poisoning to occur, it has to be intentional. If not for any other reason, because it's, it's such a high amount, it would be somewhere, don't quote me on this, but somewhere around like two tablespoons of salt directly into a child's mouth. Just like um, Babies are sort of skeptical of the salty flavor to begin with. So even if you gave them a dish doused in soy sauce or fish sauce, both of which are pretty high in sodium, they're likely to wince a little bit and spit it out. The other mm -hmm. thing that protects you in the sodium piece is that especially at six to 12 months, which is really when we're kind of focused on sodium intake because the, the, the daily adequate intake for sodium at that age is just lower than, and dramatically yeah. lower they're than smaller. They're little. Yeah. Right, right, yeah. so they're smaller. Um, but, and you know, organs are less developed and all that. But um, the, the real thing here is that baby's not actually ingesting that much from six mm -hmm. to 12 months of age. Maybe it's picking up around 10 or 11, 12 months, but especially in six to nine months, like nature's got your back. Baby's not actually swallowing that much. They don't have the skills to chew it and move the food around and, you know, actually take it in. So any cases of salt poisoning would have to be intentional. Now let's go to the middle of the road here. So we talked about the extremes. I want to take you to the middle. 80% of toddlers in the United States, infants and toddlers are too consuming what the AAP would say as too much salt. So yeah. we have this like, you don't need to be extreme about it. You don't need to fear it. You're not going to poison your child by salting the chili, by salting the roast chicken. You don't wanna be adding salt to your child's food because what we know is that there's enough salt in vegetables, in human milk, in all the things that we consume, in eggs, to get what we need. We all need a little bit of salt to live. Uh, but too much is not super healthy and can lead to hypertension and a number of other things, usually later in life, right? So doctors are mostly concerned with um, kind of priming the palate for salty foods. Mm -hmm. And then the child wants more, and that can lead to more consumption of more processed foods, which tend to be higher in salt. And then that can put you on a path for hypertension, obesity, and all the things. But it would be very hard to poison your child with, um, yeah. with salt. So don't make separate meals for your baby. What I would say is just don't season it after and exercise common, common uh, sense. Like if you are having ramen noodles, not from the packet, because that would be a bit That'd be like five days worth of sodium yeah. for your child. Yeah. But like Fine if you're you. making noodles at home and the sauce <laughs> and it calls for a little bit of soy sauce, 
Um, maybe use coconut aminos as a replacement, uh, do half and half to kind of cut the sodium down a little bit, or just, you know, don't dress baby's food as heavily in, in the sauce, but you don't need to be afraid of sharing your food with baby due to sodium. The common sense of it is if you've got a high sodium meal tonight, let's say you're making ramen noodles and you've got all this, you got your fish sauce, whatever else in there, maybe tomorrow do something that's a little bit unseasoned or, you know, less, uh, like don't do McDonald's french fries tomorrow, right? Like, as you were saying, like, so no Doritos. No right? Doritos. No yeah. Doritos. No, I mean, I think, you know, for me, always the thing that, that sort of comes out of this, and particularly when we think about the kind of broad statements like 80% of kids, you know, have more sodium than they should, like a lot of that's coming out of processed foods, right? And so yes. the, the sort of like, the like, I'm worried that like, I put some, you know, two pinches of salt in the, you know, in the, in the stew, that's that's not worth that's not worth talking that's not getting you that's like no. it's a lot of two pinches of salt to get to like you know a bag of doritos or whatever so yeah, yeah. anyway generally um, i tell parents if you can hold back a little bit on the condiments that tend to be astronomically high in sodium we're talking fish sauce soy sauce um, ketchup things like that for six to eleven months of age and but a little bit is okay but just don't go crazy and don't be afraid of seasoning your own food in the cooking process a larger dish like i said a pot of chili or a roast chicken and sharing some of that with baby the actual amount that they are swallowing is um is not as not except for the time i'll tell you when my son was like five and a half months old he ate an entire quail it was supposed to be my quail and it was, I mean, they're small. They're this tiny. is the one that was ready to go at six yeah. months old. And he was just like, he's just like shoveling it in. I was like, I don't get any. It's like, we didn't get an extra one for the baby. Anyway, there you go. Um, so, so, you know, a, light, a lighter meal, a, 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 a lighter less meal. high sodium like, meal the next time it balances exactly. out. You know, I think exactly. we sometimes think as parents, like what I fed my baby at this particular meal is like, the all be all and set all and it's all done but it's actually nutrition and all of that is really you want to really look at the whole time. week and that goes with food refusal too so yeah. if your toddler skipped lunch it's really yeah. not the end of the world look at what they're taking in in a whole week and you'll find that your stress level goes yeah. down <laughs> exactly awesome i feel like we talked forever but i said 30 minutes and so we're going to cut it at 30 minutes but thank you so much this was we love you treats i love you too and thank you it was thank an you honor everybody for listening and i will post this Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye, Thanks. everybody.